So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Noelani Punavai, who will introduce the evening plenary speaker. I just want to say a few words about Dr. Punavai. She's an assistant professor in the UH Manoa Hawaiian School of Knowledge. Her professional training is in marine and environmental science and national re natural resource management. And in her present position at the Hawaiian School of Knowledge, she seeks to integrate Hawaiian ways of knowing and understanding our aquatic environment with Western science ways of thinking. She's been affiliated with the Kaula Group, who gave you the opening Oli, um, since she was at UH Hilo more than a decade ago. So with that, I'd like to introduce Noelani. Um, so I'm here right now to just tell Ho'okama'aina you guys, just to get you guys welcome and ready to hear what Kalani Kyocho has to say to you. So as Kathleen mentioned, our local committee had a great time preparing for your visits in our islands. As part of welcoming you here, we want you to not only see our islands, our inner people, but also to feel us so that we can help you open up a window to the world. For in this world that we live in, we can understand our environment by living in our silos and talking only to those that are close to us. But we must reach across boundaries and allow ourselves to see from different perspectives. As academics, we're privileged to be able to have these opportunities, to be able to see people with a different life perspective, to see their worldviews and how they might be different than ours. And in this light, that's why we've invited Kalani Kyocho to be here with us tonight and to talk with you and to start your journey through the Hawaiian worldview. Kalani's current position allows him to represent Native Hawaiian interests at the Papahanaumoku Marine National Monument through his job at NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. As we've seen across agencies and research institutions, there's a changing of guards, and the younger generations are moving into management positions and beginning to steward these areas that we thought were once pristine and healthy, but actually need our attention. Noah is lucky to have a champion such as Kalani to help them navigate this new space. Representing our future generations, he also has the kuleana to represent the interests and the thoughts and the mana'o of his ancestors. Kalani is an appropriate person to help us introduce you to ASLO 2017. Raised on Hawaii Island, Kalani has been bathed in the rocky coastal areas, gushing with upwelled groundwater from the springs that have flown from the top of Mauna Kea. He's fished in our shallow coral reefs, and yet he's been out there on the open ocean looking for a kule. Working as a NOAA fishery observer, Kalani has truly felt the presence of Kanaloa. Kanaloa is the god that represents the element that is the ocean, the processes of the ocean. And what we want you to feel tonight is not just that we understand the physical processes of the ocean, but also the spiritual processes that happen within us as we're in his realm. The answers that the ocean has for us are hard to reveal. That's what the ocean is. It hides it until you immerse yourself in it, and then it reveals its secrets to you. Kalani's journey to his position at Noah is one that we can all relate with. He always had a keen interest in knowing how things worked, and that's why we pursue education. We want to understand the processes that occur. But sometimes you have to leave school to understand, to feel it, to participate in it. And through Kalani's experiences out there on the ocean, um, working through NOAA, working as a commercial fishery, he was able to understand and then return to complete his, his science education in the university. Kalani has been trained at many schools and through many internships and in allowing him to grow into his many skills. Um, he has skills in Hawaiian language. He has skills in understanding his ancestral Hawaiian worldview. He's been trained as a scientist and scientific diver. And he has the ability to work with communities to understand their needs. And now as a manager, he's helping to ensure that Papahanaumoku Marine National Monument, the place that represents our elder Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, are safeguarded for our future. I'm pleased tonight to welcome to our stage a plenary speaker that I think will allow you to see why we believe Hawaii is so unique. Not only our beautiful scenery and our magnificent geology, not just our climate and economy, but the reason we call Hawaii home, our people, 
Our people believe that we have one genealogy that connects our people to our lands, our seas, and skies. To call this place home is to love it like your kin, your family. With that, I introduce you to our speaker, Kalani, with whom I hope you're able to learn from tonight, to really hear his message, why we, Hawaii, and our worldview is so important to our future in this world. In that way, I hope I've Ho'okama Ainid got you a little bit more welcome and related to someone who I am so proud to be related to as a Kama Aina of Hawaii, Kalani Kyocho. <laughs> Must be my uncle back there. Huh? It is such a pleasure to be here this evening. Mahalo, I'm so grateful and humbled by this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Mahalo to the local planning committee, mahalo to Aslo and every one of you for traveling near and far to be here this evening. It's an important time together, I think. Really namai miki aloha, welcome to Hawaii. Eho ana o luna e pii ana o lalo e hui ana na moku e ku ana kapaya. Eho ana o luna e pii ana o lalo e hui ana na moku e ku ana kapaya. Eho ana o luna e pii ana o lalo e hui ana na moku e ku ana kapaya. Ei ho ana o luna e pi i ana o lalo e hui ana na moku e ku ana kapaya. Ei ho ana o luna e pi i ana o lalo e hui ana na moku e ku ana kapaya. Ei ho ana o luna e pi i ana o lalo e hui ana na moku e ku ana kapaya. When I travel to other places as an indigenous person, I often think, how do the native peoples of these landscapes, of these seascapes, view these places? What is the traditional worldview that was birthed here, that was formed here, generation after generation after generation? Mahalo. For me, like any other person, I come with my own worldview. And since we're here to talk about water, when I think about water, salty and sweet comes to mind. And not talking about my favorite local plate lunch, I'm talking about the waters of my home, where I grew up. And no matter where I'm at, a piece of me always resonates with home. I'm from Hilo. You may have heard of it or even been there. When locals think of Hilo, they think rain. The famous rain of Hilo, Kanilehua, is a mist-like rain that causes the beautiful red lehua blossoms to sound. When I was growing up, my favorite thing to do was to go to the ocean alone and dive underwater. It was like a silent escape from the rain and a chilly reminder of where I came from. Along the shores of Keokaha and Hilo, are the freshwater springs fed from Mount Nakea. So you can imagine how freezing cold these waters are, but oh, so sweet. In traditional times, the protocols that define an introduction between people would generally begin with announcing your genealogy. 
or the places you identify with, and not so often your name. The traditional thought behind this practice was that the place you were from and the people that were your ancestors were truly the constructs of your identity and perhaps your relationship to me. In Hawaiian language, when we say, Owei oi, who are you? Owei ko inoa, who is your name? The most important word in these phrases is the word wai, which in this context means who. But wai is also the word we use to mean water. Now, what is that traditional perspective? What is that perspective that was formed here, generation after generation after generation? When we say, o wai oi, who are you? We are truly asking, who are the waters that flow through you? Who are the waters that flow through your veins? Who is your bloodline? What are the names, who are the names of the waters that run through you, like the rivers, like the oceans that have sustained you for generations? O wai oi, who are your waters? And I shall tell you, Wailoa, the long waters of Hilo. Wailuku, the destructive waters of Hilo. Waiakea, the broad waters of Hilo. These are the waters of my home. Unfolded by the water are the faces of the people. Ethnically Hawaiian people are kanaka maoli. This is a Hawaiian word that means person, and maoli means native, indigenous, or true person of this land. The traditional connection between kanaka, kanaka maoli, to this land is always genealogical. Now when we're reviewing any of the cosmogonic chants of our time, these genealogical chants reveal the beginnings of Hawaiian people, whether it be Kumulipo, Vela Ahilani, O Puukahonua, or Kumuhonua. These cosmogonic chants reveal that the Aina, the land and sea, and literally that which feeds, is an ancestor to the Kanaka Mauli. Aina. Aina, literally that which feeds, can be the sea, the sky, and definitely the land. And even though the most common usage of aina refers to land, truly the extensions of this idea are aligned with this perspective. Families, communities, schools, and churches are all sources of nurture. The thing to remember is that the traditional connection between kanaka maoli and land is always genealogical. Pele is known as the akua, or goddess, of volcanic activity, and in some chants, she is the creator of these islands. Many modern Hawaiians still refer to her as Tutu Pele. Tutu means grandmother. This illustrates that the connection between Hawaiians and the Aina is ancestral, is familial. This contrasts greatly with a relationship that is defined by possession as the determining factor. Dr. Kame'ele Hiva writes, buying and selling land created by gods was even like selling one's grandmother, as Papahanao Moku was a grandmother to the Hawaiian race. Now, who is Papahanao Moku? Papahanao Moku is commonly referred to as Mother Earth, and this is true for Hawaiians, but we also see her to have other qualities. Papa means firm foundation. Hanao means to give birth. And moku means land masses or islands. And so she is the firm foundation who gives birth to islands from the oceanic womb. And even though there is no mention of the word ocean in the name of Papa Hanao Moku, this idea of the oceanic womb is still present in Hawaiian language. Of course, language is a crucial part of culture and contains the principles, philosophies, and norms that are unique to that culture. For instance, in Hawaiian language, the word nalu, which means ocean waves, also means to ponder, meditate, and reflect, but it also means amniotic fluid. 
Today, we can still observe and reflect on the birthing of islands from the oceanic womb as our ancestors have for generations. Wakea. Wakea is commonly referred to as Sky Father, but notably, he represents the standard of time and space. And we see this, this knowledge captured within his name. Wa. Wa means a time period or era and also the space or interval between objects or time. Akea. Akea means broad, unobstructive, and expansive. And so Wakea is the paternal figure personified by the broad, expansive sky and the atmospheric and celestial spaces of our universe through which other elements and natural phenomena exist in relationship to one another. Wakea. One of the most fundamental patterns for chiefly behavior was established in the epic tradition of Papa and Wakea, who according to the Opu'u Kahonua cosmology, were a half brother and half sister. Papa and Wakea are said to be the progenitors of the Hawaiian Islands and the ancestors of native Hawaiians. Now according to that same tradition, the taro plant is the elder sibling of the first mortal chief and both are descendants of the gods. The taro plant called Haloa, when referring to this ancestral connection, is the elder sibling of the Hawaiian race, and as such, deserves great respect. The taro plant, known as Kalo in Hawaii, was the main staple of the people of old. Hawaiians developed over 300 unique varieties of Kalo that are suitable for different climates and habitats. These traditions contain the principles of practice which are to care for these islands, care for family, and reminds us that these islands are family. Ililio Halua, pebbles of Halua, to mean descendants of chiefs of Halua, grandson of Wakea and Papa. Heali ika aina hekawa ke kanaka, land is the chief a man is the steward. According to Kamanaikalani Bimer, Kamehameha and all other ali'i or ruling chiefs of Hawaii derive their right to rule out of three categories, spiritual, genealogical, and material, all of which were measured by their ability to ensure a state of pono, which is a holistic state of integrity, harmony, and balance. At the same time, I don't want to mislead anyone by giving romanticized notions. Things were not always perfect in traditional times. But I will say that at the time that Cook, Captain Cook arrived, there were about one million Hawaiians in these islands. And 100% of the resources were derived locally here in these islands. Today, according to the Department of Agriculture, Hawaii's food is about 85 to 90% of Hawaii's food is imported, which makes about 10% locally derived. This makes us particularly invulnerable to natural disasters and global events that might disrupt shipping and the food supply, as you can imagine. The Mali historian David Malo evaluates the kuleana of an ali'i nui, or ruling chief, which is to maintain a pono relationship between him or herself and the maka'ainana or commoners. The ali'i nui or ruling chief who is the body of the government must ensure that a pono relationship of aloha exists between themselves and their people lest they be beaten and killed by the commoners. I'll repeat that. The high chief, the head of state who is the body of the government must ensure that a pono relationship of aloha exists between themselves and their people lest to be beaten and killed by the citizens of the nation. The rearing of a chief is the ruling of an ahupua'a. As land and ocean tenure advanced in traditional society, it, start to, it started to flourish, and experts were able to refine their individual practices and establish sophisticated cultural frameworks of understanding and interacting with their environment. As the population grew, 
Oral histories tell us that different ali'i established the foundation for an advanced resource management system at different times on each island. Just, just as the ruling chief, Kalamai, the Ahupua is the chiefly political subdivision of this natural resource management system that is based on traditional and ancestral understandings of the environment. The system allows for the holistic management of social, economic, political, spiritual, and environmental systems. The literal meaning of ahupua'a is broken up into two words, pig and cairn, which is a stone altar-like structure. Each ahupua'a was demarcated with a cairn, which was mounted by a wood carving of a pig's head. The pig is a symbol of fertility, abundance, and procreation. Today, some of the traditional Ahupua'a boundaries are mar marked by street signs along major roads. On Oahu, the signs depict a cairn mounted with a wood-carved pig head, as well as the name of the Ahupua'a. The one on the left is about one mile from here, which is the border of Waikiki. As you can see, there's a wall at the border. This is a diagram of the four major land divisions within the system portrayed with the island of Oahu. The Mokupuni is the island. Moku is the district, and this division can also be represented or called Okana or Kalana, but less common. Then you have the Ahupua'a and the Ili, which are tracts of land within an Ahupua'a, and unlike the other divisions of land, don't necessarily occupy the entire land area of the Ahupua'a. In other words, the Mokupuni is made up of a number of Moku, the moku is made up of a number of ahupua'a, but an ahupua'a is not necessarily made up of ili. The system of land and ocean tenure has been called the ahupua'a system, and I occasionally use the term myself. But speaking of ahupua'a as if they exist separately from other traditional native divisions of land may give them a prominence that they might not have had when the system was better understood. This map is a reconstruction of the major land divisions of Oahu prior to 1848. The island was divided into 86 ahupua'a. They were contained in six districts of, called Moku. You are currently in the Moku of Kona, similar to Kona on Hawaii Island. These are said to be the same divisions established by Ma'ili Kukahi, the ruling chief of Oahu, around 1500 AD. The Moku were divided into Ahupua'a, the chief political subdivision, for the purpose of taxation. And each of these sections was subject to a lower chief, who was known as the Ali'i Ai Ahupua'a, or the chief who eats the Ahupua'a. As I mentioned, the term Ahupua'a arose because the seaward boundary of each ahupua'a was marked by an altar or ahu on which a sculpted head of a pig was mounted on top during the collection of harvest offerings for the god of rain, agriculture, fertility, and abundance. And tribute for this earthly representative, the ruling chief, during the annual Makahiki festival. The title to an ahupua'a was not her hereditary these subdivisions were allocated and reallocated to loyal supporters of the chief at the time of his accession. Proprietorship of an ahupua gave the right to collect taxes from that area. Actually, from the point of the maka'ainana, or the commoners, the system was one of sharecropping rather than taxation. And this sharing between chief and tenant was comprehensive and reciprocal in benefits. It also assured subsistence shares in food, fish, firewood, house timbers, thatch, and the like, and to the lesser landholder, of course, the farmer and the fisherman. On the island of Oahu, Ma'ili Kukahi is recognized for establishing the Ahupua'a system. On the islands of Kauai, Mano Kalanipo, high chief of his island, and also Umiali Loa, high chief of Hawaii Island, established similar systems on each of their islands that were different because of the geology of each of the particular islands. <laughs> the 
Many authors have written about Hawaiian land terms, which, were, which there are many, and from these writings, other definitions and interpretations of Hawaiian land terms have been presented. For instance, take the word ahupua'a. Through this same, through some modern uses, it has been equated to that of a watershed or a self-sufficient division of Malkatumakai mountain to coastal resources among its inhabitants. But this is not always the case. A reading of early Hawaiian scholars such as Malo and Kamakau include neither of these theories of watershed or self-sufficiency. David Malo is one of the first to write about Hawaiian land terms. He was a leading historian, historian of the Kingdom of Hawaii who experienced much of what he wrote and also had the opportunity to learn and record from the knowledge of elders in the first half of the 1800s. This particular map was created by Ursula Emerson in 1833 when David Malo was still alive. The writings of David Malo discuss land terms such as moku, ahupua'a, and ili as being successively smaller land divisions, as we saw on the previous slides. Malo does not talk about the ahupua'a with the common definition of ahupua'a, as is offered by the many scholars. Ziegler seems to categorize this common definition well, as he writes, ideally, although not invariably in practice, each ahupua'a consisted of a relatively narrow triangular area of land with its apex at the highest point of an island or proximate mountain ridge, extending down slope to its base along the coast. Each usually represented a discrete watershed and its Mauka Makai range helped to ensure the inclusion of natural resources characteristic of all elevations and even marine environments because resident exploitation rights extended far offshore. In the next few slides, we will refer to this description to broaden the understanding of an ahupua'a and the system. One Hawaiian method of describing something is to say what it is not. So the triangle and pie-shaped descriptions are commonly used to define an ahupua'a, but majority do not fit this description. This image depicts the traditional boundaries for the ahupua'a of Waikiki on Oahu. You are here. Now we will briefly look at the generalization of ahupua'a as discrete watersheds, which is false. The proposition that ahupua'a are equivalent to watersheds empties them of the system, people, and context in which they were developed. It is also incorrect since many ahupua'a are not watersheds. And in many cases, streams themselves were palena or boundaries for the ahupua'a, which you know by definition cannot be the boundary of a watershed. The top image is a USGS map of the watershed units in the Moku or district of Ewa, colored in gray. The image below depicts the traditional boundaries of the ahupua'a in the district of Ewa, which is colored in tan. As you may notice, most of the boundaries are not the same. And finally, we will briefly look at the generalization that all ahupua'a are self-sufficient. So suggesting that ahupua'a, including all the resources needed for the survival of its inhabitants, is incorrect. Many ahupua'a did not include certain resources that were necessary for survival. And yet, maka'ainana, or commoners, were able to acquire them from other ahupua'a, which is part of the socioeconomic attributes of the system. One example that allows us to touch upon the diversity of Ahupua'a on different islands is the case of Kaho'olawe. Kaho'olawe, the island in, the, in this image, is actually a part of the moku of Honua'ula on Maui, colored in red. In addition, Kaho'olawe is comprised of eight ili, land divisions smaller than the Ahupua'a. Therefore, the island of Kaho'olawe should be an Ahupua'a, even though it is an island. But why would Kaho'olawe be a part of Maui? Well, one aspect is that it does not have enough resources, even though it is a mokupuni or an island. And in the case of water, the moku of Honua'ula is its source of water. The island of Kaho'olawe is in the rain shadow of Maui. As you can see in the top images, the rain clouds gather around the summit of Haleakala 
and from its southwest ridge will occasionally extend to Koholawe, as is seen in the bottom right photo. The bottom left photo shows a rain altar that is, the sum that is on the summit of Koholawe. This is an example of the spiritual and environmental attributes of the system and reminds us of the importance of water or wai. Wai. Wai is the determining factor in the delineation, governance, and management of the Ahupua'a system. In addition, the word wai is used in many other words in Hawaiian language, which highlights its cultural significance and the constructs of Hawaiian thinking. Kana wai. Since there were strict laws that governed the use and conduct with water, some scholars think that the word kana wai, which means law, regulation, or decree, is derived from wai. We do know that the word wai wai comes from the base word wai. Wai wai means wealth, importance, valuable, useful, and rich. This certainly is the case if you have plenty of water like Wai Ale Ale, the summit of Kauai, which is arguably the wettest place on earth. And if you have plenty of water, then you were probably favored by the gods, right? The gods Kane and Kanaloa are often associated with one another as being deities of opposing dualities of Hawaiian worldview. And at the same time, they are companions. Migrating from the ancestral homeland of Kahiki, they traveled together from the Hawaiian Islands, around the Hawaiian Islands, opening freshwater springs for their ava or kava. You would be interested to know that among the many things that they represent, the god Kane represents fresh water, and the god Kanaloa represents salt water. They are also paired in works such as the creation of a canoe, in which Kane is involved with the harvesting of the tree and parts of its construction, and Kanaloa is invoked in bringing it to life on the sea. They also represent the East and the West, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, and life and death. Our kupuna, called the Milky Way, Kawai Nuya Kane, the Great Waters of Kane. And scientists have just discovered that the Milky Way is made up much of water. Kaua o ili ili makaukua the rain that appears here and there to denote the presence of a god. In the words of Colette Lemomi Akana, rain names are a precious legacy from our kupuna, or ancestors, who were keen observers of the world around them and who had nuanced understandings of the forces of nature. They knew that one place could have several types of rain each distinct from the other. They knew when a particular rain would fall, its color, its duration, its intensity, its path, its sound, its scent, and its effect on the land and their lives. In the spiritual realm, various Hawaiian gods are manifested in the rains. In daily life, rain names connect us to the tradition of Mo'olelo, detailing rich characteristics of places and events. In name, some rains identify their home, the Mololani rain of Mololani. Some describe their own characteristics, the Nihipali rain, which Nihis sneaks along the cliffs, Pali. Some hold literal and figurative meanings. The Kanilehua rain can refer to the rustling of lehua flowers or to the chattering of birds on lehua trees, alluding to gossip. Many refer to native vegetation abundant in the place associated with the rain. The kahiko hala to adorn the hala rain associated with kekele o'ahu. Rain names are a treasure of cultural, historical, and environmental information. The existence of hundreds, perhaps thousands, of rain and wind names is evidence of the value our kupuna, our ancestors, attached to these forces. This intimacy is related to the concept of aloha aina, which embodies love of land, love for country, love for nation, and love for people. This concept is alive and thriving today as people live Hawaiian culture, reconcile desecrated lands, 
reestablish water flow to our streams, plant kalo, build fish ponds, and reconnect to ancestral spaces. Today, we see a resurgence of culture and identity that allows for traditional principles and values to be made new again with the changing times. This allows cultural principles to continue to, to thrive, like malama aina, which means to care for the land. The motto of Hawaii is ua mau kea o ka aina i ka pono. Ua mau kea o ka aina i ka pono, the phrase proclaimed by King Kamehameha III, translates as the sovereignty of the land is perpetuated through the secured harmony of its people. Indigenous cultures are complex and reflect the constructs of people's intimate relationships with their environment. This clearly and concisely articulates the spiritual, genealogical, and material connections of Hawaiian people to the Aina. For Papaha Naomokua Kea Marine National Monument, we honor the ancestral connections that Native Hawaiians have with the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. As the Native Hawaiian Program Coordinator, my responsibilities include coordinating and implementing the strategies and activities related to Native Hawaiian cultural access, education, research, partnerships, and the overall integration of Native Hawaiian values and concepts into the daily management of the monument. I must say it is an honor to have this position. In some way or another, the knowledge that is available to us all has been founded on what has been learned before. Every generation, every peoples, every place has valuable knowledge for us to inherit. Honoring indigenous peoples by supporting traditional knowledge, indigenous language, and the principles, philosophies, and practices which are unique parts of human heritage benefit us all. We have much to gain from reviewing the foundational understandings and relationships that indigenous peoples have with all parts of the earth as part of our collective pursuit for adaptive management frameworks, another essential step in developing a healthy relationship with our island earth. As the Hawaiian proverb says, ikava ma mua, ikava ma hope. The future lies within the past. Mahalo for your time, and I wish you a successful ASLO conference. Aloha.